Hi, we're going to learn about memory now. There are people that have extremes, people that can't forget anything, and then there are people that can't remember anything. Are you one of those people? Most of us are somewhere in between, which really is how we should be. Our brains actually are designed to forget somewhat. We're going to look at how do we get information into our brain? How do we store it there? How do we get it back out? We're also going to look at are our memories fallible? Are they, can we rely on our memories? Or do we remember things differently than they actually happened? Uh, and the most really important part of this is how can you improve your memory? Because like we said, it's you. It's all your past, everything that makes you you. It also is like, how do you communicate all of those things? It's extremely important. It does definitely help you out in your studies at school too. So we'll have a look at that coming up right now in the memory unit. All right, we're going to start venturing into memory. And just remember, you can pause these videos and look at things. I'd like you to have a look at the learning objectives for this chapter. It's good to know what you're trying to find out. So this will explain it. Just have a pause, read through those, and I'll let you know. We're going to start, though, with a definition of memory. So memory, like we said, is it's about you. It's everything you know. You What would you be without your memory? But our definition is going to be the persistence of learning over time through the encoding, storage, and retrieval of information. So encode, storage, retrieve. It's kind of like a computer system. It was one of the early kind of ex explanations. You have a keyboard that encodes information. You had a disk. Uh, by the way, that little disk down there is a floppy disk, which you may not know. It's like a thumb drive or whatever you kids use today. Um, and then a monitor, which you probably haven't seen a monitor like that for a long time either. But that's kind of how it works. You encode it, you store it, you retrieve it, which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? We look first at the Atkinson and Schifrin. It's a three-stage model. It includes what we call sensory memory, which is all the stuff that we gather through our, our senses, our sight, our, it's the sound, what we feel, how we remember those things. Then we store it into what we call short-term memory, which means it's there for a short period of time. And then, of course, we would go further into long-term memory. We store it for hours, sometimes a lifetime. So it works like this. With our working memory, we have external events that happen outside. It goes into our sensory memory, into our working short-term, into our long-term, but it works like this. Working memory is our new name for short-term memory because we get all this external input from outside, what you see, hear, smell, touch, and so on, which goes into your sensory memory. And we store a pretty good copy of that for a period of time. And then if we pay attention to it, and that's the first rule of remembering things is paying attention to it. It will go back into our, what we call short term memory. And then if we use it there and pay attention further and more deeply encode it, we get into our long term storage of memory. However, we can retrieve it there and we bring it back into what we used to call short term memory. So it's not really short term anymore. So it's kind of a misnomer. Also, on the other side of things, you'll notice the, the arrow, if you follow the mouse here, Sometimes external events happen and we don't even effortly process them, but it runs all the way down here into our long-term memory where we can retrieve it and use it without any effort at all. Wouldn't it be nice to remember everything without effort? So effortful versus automatic processing. Okay. Explicit memories are those memories that we can declare. We know how we learned it, our facts, our psychology, vocabulary, math problems we, we've learned how to work out. We remember how to do that. We know how we learned it. We can, we can declare how we, that type of memory. So they're all the facts and experiences that we can recall. The automatic processing is more associated with what we call implicit type of memories. Implicit memories are formed without our awareness that we are building a memory and without rehearsal or other processing and working memory. So there are several things that we will encode implicitly. Space, for example. Um, if you're reading a magazine, uh, you know there was a picture on the top of the page. You didn't keep reading through the picture, did you? You didn't have to memorize that. You just automatically process it. Time. Uh, we know the passage of time, how much time has passed. Uh, if we go back through the day and trace our steps, we can probably remember what we did along the way. And the other thing is frequency. For example, I bumped into that girl I really like three times today. Okay, 
we didn't consciously remember that, but implicitly we have stored that. So it's gone straight from external event all the way into our long-term storage where we can retrieve it later. So sensory memory, what about that? It's the immediate large capacity, very brief recording of sensory information in the memory system. There was a guy named Sperling in 1960 that said, you know, we probably remember a lot more in our sensory memory than we give credit for. So he did this uh, experiment where he took these nine letters, I guess they are, and he would use these nine letters and he would flash them for a very brief period of time and see how we could remember it. So for about five milliseconds, one twentieth of a second. And when he did that, we'd ask for a whole report. He'd flash it and say, what can you remember? And on average, it was about 44% of these letters we could remember without being asked to remember which ones we want. The next time he did it, though, because his theory was that we kept all this information in our sensory system, um, he would show the letters and then he would ring a high tone to indicate he wanted you to recall the top row of letters or a medium tone, the mid middle le le row of letters, or a low tone, the bottom level. Um, however, he would do this right after he, he um, would show it. So the image was actually gone and then he asked you to remember without looking. Remember, people could only remember 44%. With these partial report things though, he found if it was right afterwards, right after it came off, people could recall 100% of the time. And how much longer he went between the image coming away and asking people to remember, of course, the less they could. And here's a chart to, to represent that. You can see, um, you know, 80% is remembered after 0.15 seconds. It was 100% right away. And down to, uh, you know, 25% one second later. So if we don't pay attention to it, it's gone right away. But it's all there to begin with. Sensory memories, we have uh, what we would call iconic, echoic, and hepatic. Iconic memories are those that we see. Remember, I? See, that's an I. It starts with I, so it's like an I, I see. So iconic memories last for about a half a second, and then they're gone. This is the sensory memory. Echoic, about three to four seconds. And hepatic, which is our sense of touch, would be less than one second, and then it's gone. But if we're asked to recall it right away, we could. Uh, your echoic, for example, would be in class. You're not paying attention to the teacher. I know you don't do that because you all pay attention all the time. But uh, you're not paying attention at all. And the teacher says, just repeat to me what I just said. And for some reason, you can pull out of it the last three or four seconds that came up and you can fool that teacher, but not me, because I know better. Once, once we've encoded into our sensory memory, that what we pay attention to goes into our working memory, which we discussed a little bit earlier. It's our new term for short-term memory, newer understanding, which focuses on conscious active processing of incoming auditory and visual spatial information and of information retrieved from long-term memory. Notice and retrieved from long-term memory because these could be events that went straight from our external event to long-term memory and we're able to retrieve that. How much can we put in there? Well, it was discovered uh, that we can hold about seven plus or minus two bits of information. For example, a string of five to nine letters. That would be kind of on average if we asked you to, to remember and keep it into your, into your short term or working memory. Um, however, along with this magic number, more recent research has actually shown if it's digits, we can recall about seven. If it's letters, it'd be about six or it would be about five words. Um, which is kind of interesting with this magic number of seven plus or minus two, how we can actually kind of work and fool that system. We can actually chunk information into meaningful bits and we can actually fool it into storing a little bit more information than perhaps those five to seven, five to nine pieces. For example, try to remember these below. There they are. Look at them quick. They're going to go away. They're gone away, but if, well, they're still there anyways, but if you chunk those together in a meaningful way, like A-O-K, A-O-K, C-I-A, F-B-I, R-O-F-L, or C-Y-U, 
um, you would be able to remember those things and your short term memory or your working memory. It's like you remembered five things, but actually you remembered all of those letters because you could break it back down. So you can fool that short term system or that working system a little bit to get more information in there. Uh, other examples of chunking that you might be aware of um, acronyms like HOMES, the Great Lakes, PEMDAS. I think a lot of us use BEDMAS for the arithmetic operations. Um, Roy G. Biv is one that we all use for the colors of the visible spectrum and, of course, our, our rainbow, uh, which is really handy. Uh, and many of you remember those in order because of Roy G. Biv. Some other uh, effortful processing strategies that we can use. Um, and the term mnemonics is actually a term for all of these things uh, in a general sense. We can use visual imagery. We can, we can picture things, which makes things more easy. Your brain works by association. If we can picture things, we can make associations with pictures much easier. Uh, we can use a peg word system, which we'll talk more about in class, which is a way, um, a, a peg word, for example, one is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree. We can associate through a visual image whatever number one is on our list with a bun, whatever number two is with a shoe, number three with the tree, and so on. And we'll look at that more closely in class. Distributed practices is an important thing. You know, everybody says, you know, you shouldn't uh, cram for tests. Well, research has borne that out. There's a thing called a spacing effect. And what we found is if you study something for a short period of time, leave it for a time, and then study again for a short period of time, you will encode it faster into your long-term memory. Uh, mass practice is not a good idea. Uh, many, of you, many of you cram for your test, you're doing it wrong. It's a lot harder um, than if we do it in small small bits. The testing effect is real big. I'm going to have you read a little bit of research on the testing effect in class. But the testing effect is kind of along the lines of when you test yourself, it actually helps you remember things better. Um, you know, so like writing out flashcards of vocabulary terms is all great, uh, but the testing of it is actually what helps you remember it. Or maybe you've had a test and then after you go, geez, you know, I think I could do better on that test again. Not because you remember the questions, but you remember the concepts because you went through the testing and your brain searches, it pays more attention and it makes these associations for you much easier. Oops. Uh, also, there's levels of processing and how we do it. Shell processing um, is when we don't give a lot of meaning to something. Deep processing is we give meaning. For example, in our first word, uh, example here is the word in capital letters, chairs. So we're looking at a visual kind of clue here. So visual encoding in this case is not deep. It is shallow processing. Does it rhyme with train? This is an acoustic type of processing. Um, we may encode it a little bit, but again, it's not deeply. But if we look at would the word fit into the sentence, the girl put the blank on the table, then you're actually giving that some meaning. Um, we call it semantic learning. And semantics, when something has meaning, it's easier for your brain to create the associations. And when you find out how we store it in long term, it'll make a lot more sense to you why that's more important. Something really important for you guys is if you can make the material personally meaningful. When you're learning something, what does this mean to me? Are there examples in my life? How can I apply that in my life? Are there friends I have it? Psychology is really an easy one to do it because almost everything is applicable to your life or to someone else's life that you can give it personal meaning. When you do that, it encodes quite deeply. It's known as the self-reference effect and it is quite powerful. So always try to do that. Other thing your brain like is hierarchies. Um, it, and a hierarchy is when we break it down from a broad category into more specifics. Uh, when we learn the uh, nervous system, we will use a hierarchy. We teach it that way. And if you remember that way, uh, your brain seems to like it and people will usually remember the systems. And we will be getting that into that in uh, its unit two, uh, all about the brain. Now on to long-term memory. This is where the ultimate goal, probably where we want things are. However, a lot of things we only need in working memory, so there is no reason to store it into long-term memory. Our long-term memory has an unlimited store. Its capacity is huge. Um, in fact, we consider it to be kind of limitless. So all you people, you think you know so much, your brains are full, guess again. There's room in there. We can fit more information in there. So don't worry about learning too many things. You're good. 
Uh, here, look at this little bird, Clark's Nutcracker. 6,000 caches of buried pine seeds during the winter and spring. He remembers them all. That's pretty good. Hopefully you can remember that many vocab terms. So if we break it down in this chart, and this is a good one to look at, um, we got sensory memory, working memory, long-term memory, the encoding of it, sensory memory, definite copy of it, um, our working memory, we, we encode it. And by the way, when we encode into that working memory, we turn it into phonemic, which means a sound, a word. So we use words are really important in, in our memory. And long-term memory is semantic. It gives it meaning. It makes associations in your brain so your brain can pull these associations out. And we'll look at some examples of that in class too. Um, the capacity of your sensory memory is basically unlimited. Um, it's like a carbon copy of everything you have, but it only lasts about 0.25 seconds. Our working memory, again, the magic number, seven plus or minus two. Uh, a lot of people don't like it to be called the magic number, but that's what we call it in our, from our textbook. Lasts about 20 seconds. So things in your working memory are there for about 20 seconds where you can use it. Um, our long-term memory uh, is very large. It seems to be unlimited and duration can again be for years. So that's our introduction into memory. In our next section, uh, we'll be looking more uh, at how fallible are our memories, uh, how do we retrieve our memories, and so on. So we will see you next time for the next part of Unit 7 Cognition. Bye for now.